Imagine delving into the depths of the Great Pyramid of Khufu, an ancient wonder that's like a riddle wrapped in a mystery, all encased in massive stone blocks. Now, scientists and archaeologists, with their fancy gadgets like 3D laser scanning and cosmic ray imaging, are uncovering secrets that have been hidden for thousands of years. It's like they're peeling back layers of time, revealing a complex labyrinth of passageways and chambers, some of which haven't seen the light of day since they were sealed. Now get this, one of the most mind-blowing finds is this huge void sitting right above the Grand Gallery. They found it using muon radiography, a technique that's all about catching cosmic rays, and it's got everyone buzzing with theories. Could it be an architectural trick, a secret burial spot, or maybe even a stash for something sacred or super valuable? The way this space is positioned, it's got folks thinking it might have been a clever move to keep the King's Chamber from collapsing. Talk about ancient engineering smarts. But the mystery doesn't stop there. Thanks to 3D scans, we're getting a glimpse of how incredibly detailed and precise the pyramid's innards are. It's so intricate that it blows our minds how the folks back then pulled it off. This has sparked all sorts of wild ideas. Maybe the builders had some kind of advanced tech or knowledge that got lost over time. Who knows? And here's another twist. Researchers have stumbled upon smaller, hidden chambers and sneaky passageways crisscrossing through the pyramid. Egyptologists are scratching their heads, wondering if these were secret rooms for the pharaoh's spirit, or maybe vaults for sacred texts or astrological stuff. These hidden nooks and crannies add even more layers to the puzzle of what the pyramid was really for and how it was built. All these discoveries are stirring up big debates about the pyramids and the civilization that crafted them. The architectural genius on display here is making us question everything we thought we knew about ancient Egypt. It's even got some people thinking about lost civilizations or hold on to your hats, maybe even help from outer space. The pyramids, especially the Great Pyramid of Khufu, have been the center of speculation about extensive subterranean worlds. One prevailing theory suggests that the ancient Egyptians constructed elaborate underground labyrinths as a means to protect the pharaoh's treasures and sacred artifacts from grave robbers. These hypothesized labyrinths are often described as intricate networks of tunnels and chambers filled with booby traps and hidden doors straight out of an adventure novel. Another fascinating theory is the speculation of hidden chambers that could contain scrolls or texts revealing ancient wisdom and practices. These hypothetical chambers, according to some, might hold records of medical procedures, astronomical knowledge or even detailed accounts of daily life in ancient Egypt, offering an unprecedented window into the past. More sensational theories have ventured into the realm of the extraterrestrial, proposing that the pyramids might house artifacts or technology not of this world. Proponents of this theory often point to the pyramid's architectural complexity and alignment with celestial bodies as evidence of alien influence or intervention. Moving on to the Great Sphinx, which lies close to the pyramids, the enigma deepens. This colossal statue with the body of a lion and the head of a human is believed by some to guard significant secrets beneath its paws. The most popular of these theories is the alleged Hall of Records, a hidden chamber said to contain the knowledge of the lost civilization of Atlantis, as suggested by Edgar Cayce. Archaeological and geological studies around the Sphinx have added fuel to these theories. Seismic surveys have indicated the presence of cavities or chambers beneath the Sphinx, although their purpose or contents remain unknown. Some researchers have proposed that these could be natural formations, while others speculate about man-made rooms or galleries. The allure of the Sphinx's subterranean secrets is amplified by the lack of historical records explaining its origin or purpose. This void in our understanding of the Sphinx has allowed alternative theories, ranging from ancient libraries to hidden tombs, to flourish. The exploration of what lies beneath the pyramids is now aided by cutting-edge technology. Ground-penetrating radar, thermal imaging and muon radiography are among the tools that have opened new windows into understanding these ancient structures. These technologies allow researchers to probe the pyramid's depths without disturbing their structural integrity, revealing secrets that have been hidden for millennia. You know, the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in the Valley of the Kings near Luxor, Egypt, is something straight out of an Indiana Jones movie. It's incredible. This valley, right on the west bank of the Nile opposite Luxor, which was ancient Thebes back in the day, was like the Beverly Hills of burial sites for Egypt's pharaohs during the New Kingdom period. 
from the 16th to the 11th centuries BCE. They chose it for its secluded, almost hidden location. It's like they wanted to keep it a secret from tomb raiders. By the time they buried Tutankhamun there, around 1323 BCE, it was already pretty crowded with royal tombs. Enter Howard Carter, this British archaeologist, who had this gut feeling that the valley still had secrets to reveal, despite what other experts thought. He was like a detective on a mission, funded by Lord Carnarvon, an English earl with deep pockets and a taste for adventure. And then, boom. On November 4, 1922, Carter's team hit the jackpot. They found steps leading to Tutankhamun's tomb, KV-62. This was a game-changer and the result of Carter's unyielding determination. The excavation was like a scene from a thriller. They first cleared a staircase and then found this sealed entrance with the Royal Necropolis seal. It was like a sign saying, yes, there's something amazing here. Carter was super meticulous, recording every single detail and snapping pictures like there was no tomorrow. When they got through the entrance, they found themselves in this antechamber that was like a treasure-filled room of wonders with chariots, beds, chairs, and all sorts of ritual objects. It was all a bit chaotic, which made them think that some ancient robbers had a go at it not once, but twice. But wait, there's more. Next to this antechamber was this smaller room called the Annex, stuffed to the brim with all sorts of goods. Then the main event, the burial chamber. This was where the sarcophagus and Tutankhamun's mummy were. Talk about an awe-inspiring sight. And as if that wasn't enough, there was another room, the treasury, filled with precious objects meant for the afterlife. The array of artifacts they found there gave us this incredible glimpse into what life was like during the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt. The tomb was smaller and less showy than others in the valley, but what made it stand out was how untouched it was, aside from the earlier robberies. This discovery was a gold mine for Egyptologists. It was like they hit the jackpot in understanding the burial customs, art and day-to-day -day items from that era. The whole thing, I tell you, it was just out of this world. Now the real showstoppers in there were Tutankhamun's solid gold coffin and that iconic gold funerary mask. You know the one, right? It's practically the face of ancient Egypt, decked out with lapis lazuli, quartz and other colorful stones. Pure artistry. And let's not forget about the six chariots and those fancy thrones. They were like the Bentleys and thrones of their time, showing off the incredible craftsmanship and tech skills of the ancient Egyptians. But wait, there's more. The bling in that tomb would make any jewelry enthusiast green with envy. We're talking necklaces, bracelets, rings, amulets, all made from gold and precious stones. And then there were toys and games like the Senate board game, which give us a glimpse into the fun side of royal life back then. What's really mind-blowing is how intact everything was. Sure, some ancient tomb raiders tried to crash the party, but they didn't get far, and most of the treasure was left just as it was. The dry Egyptian climate and the sealed tomb did a fantastic job preserving everything, including organic stuff like wood, textiles, and leather. Now, the big guy himself, Tutankhamun, was resting in three coffins nested like Russian dolls. The innermost one, solid gold. Talk about resting in style. His mummy was in pretty good shape too, which was great for the scientists. They went full CSI with CT scans and DNA testing on him. These scans showed us what he looked like and gave us the lowdown on his health. Plus, the DNA tests confirmed his royal lineage and even gave us hints about what might have caused his untimely death. Everything from genetic diseases to malaria has been on the table. So when you look at everything in that tomb, it's like a window straight into the world of ancient Egypt. It's a treasure trove of information about how they lived, what they valued, and even how they viewed the afterlife. The discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb isn't just a chapter in a history book. It's a cornerstone in our understanding of one of the most fascinating civilizations in history. Let's dive into this whole Pharaoh's curse thing with Tutankhamun's tomb. It's like something out of a Hollywood script, but it's been part of the Tutankhamun story since 1922. This cursed tale has become just as famous as the actual archaeological facts. So what kicked off this legend? Well, it started with some pretty eerie coincidences. The big one was the death of Lord Carnarvon, the guy who funded the whole excavation. He died from a mosquito bite that got infected, and it happened just a few months after they opened the tomb. People started whispering, Hey, isn't that a bit too coincidental? The newspapers of the time went wild with this. They were all about spinning tales of an ancient curse smiting those who dared disturb the pharaoh's rest. 
They even cooked up this story about a curse inscribed at the tomb's entrance, warning of doom for anyone who entered. But here's the kicker. No such inscription was ever found. Classic case of the press letting their imagination run wild, right? This idea of a mysterious curse really grabbed the public's attention. It was the perfect mix of ancient Egypt's allure and the supernatural. But let's get real for a second. Scientists have looked into these supposed curse-related deaths and come up with more down-to-earth explanations. Things like exposure to molds or bacteria that had been chilling in the tomb for ages. And when you look at the stats, most folks involved with the tomb lived pretty normal lifespans for that time. So maybe this curse is more myth than reality. But let's not overlook the psychological angle. If you believe you're cursed, it might mess with your head and health, right? Now, despite all the spooky curse talk, the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb is a massive deal in Egyptology. It's given us an unmatched look into the burial practices and life of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs. I think we're getting very close to rediscovering some of the things that um, our ancient ancestors were up to. And um, so through somehow, through this technology, they're able to move stones or cut stones or all the above? All the above. And, the above. and even transport them? In the fascinating realm of Randall Carlson's sacred number theory, numbers transcend their basic arithmetic function embodying deep cosmic and spiritual significance. This theory, interwoven with the principles of sacred geometry, posits that certain numbers and the geometric patterns they represent hold a universal, almost mystical quality, observable in nature, ancient architecture, and cosmology. A cornerstone of this theory is the examination of specific numbers that recur with astonishing frequency across various natural, architectural and astronomical contexts. Take the number 108 for instance. In Hinduism it's considered sacred and in astronomy it's intriguingly represented as the approximate distance ratio. The distance from the earth to the sun is about 108 times the sun's diameter and the distance from the earth to the moon is roughly 108 times the moon's diameter. This pattern appears too frequently to be mere coincidence according to Carlson's theory, suggesting an underlying cosmic order. Carlson's theory further delves into the realm of sacred geometry, exploring how shapes like the flower of life, the Fibonacci spiral, and the golden ratio, approximately 1.618, are fundamental to understanding the structure of the universe. These patterns are found everywhere in nature. From the arrangement of leaves on a stem, to the spirals of galaxies, the golden ratio, in particular, is seen in the proportions of the Parthenon in Greece and the Great Pyramid of Giza, indicating that ancient architects might have employed these as sacred proportions to mirror the harmony found in nature. In exploring ancient architectural marvels, Carlson points out how these structures were often aligned with astronomical phenomena. For example, the Great Pyramid of Giza aligns with the cardinal points of the compass, while Stonehenge aligns with the solstices. These alignments are not arbitrary but deliberate, indicating a sophisticated understanding of celestial movements. This knowledge, coupled with the use of sacred numbers in their design, suggests that these ancient structures were more than just physical edifices. They were constructed with a deep understanding of and connection to the cosmos. Moreover, Carlson's theory touches upon the idea that ancient civilizations might have encoded this knowledge of sacred numbers and geometry into their myths and religious texts. This idea proposes that stories and symbols from ancient texts are not just folklore or religious dogma, but are allegorical representations of profound scientific and astronomical knowledge. Venturing further into Randall Carlson's exploration of sacred numbers, we enter the realm of sacred geometry a concept that suggests the universe itself is constructed on geometric principles. This intriguing notion posits that certain geometric shapes and patterns are foundational to the physical world. From the microcosm of atomic structures to the macrocosm of galaxies. Central to the idea of sacred geometry is the concept of the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio. 
often symbolized by the spiral pattern seen in galaxies, hurricanes, and even the structure of DNA. The Fibonacci sequence, a series of numbers where each number is the sum of the two preceding ones, manifests in the natural world in surprising ways. For instance, a pattern of seeds in a sunflower follows this sequence, leading to the formation of a spiral that adheres to the golden ratio. Carlson's theory explores how this ratio, approximately 1.618, is not just a mathematical curiosity, but a fundamental characteristic of the universe. This divine proportion is found in the shells of snails, the structure of human faces. It's as though this ratio represents a cosmic blueprint for aesthetic and structural perfection. In the realm of astronomy, sacred geometry is evident in the orderly patterns of planetary orbits and the distribution of galaxies in the cosmos. The intricate dance of celestial bodies follows predictable geometric paths, suggesting a harmonious and orderly universe that resonates with the principles of sacred geometry. Delving deeper into Randall Carlson's sacred number theory, we encounter the mesmerizing world of ancient civilizations and their seemingly intentional alignments with cosmic phenomena. This segment explores how various ancient structures around the world are not just feats of architectural grandeur, but also sophisticated astronomical observatories, revealing a profound understanding of celestial mechanics. One of the most iconic examples is the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. According to Carlson's theory, this pyramid is not only a marvel of engineering, but also a structure deeply embedded with astronomical significance. The pyramid's sides are closely aligned to the cardinal points of the compass, and the structure's dimensions are said to be a scale model of the Earth, incorporating the sacred numbers and geometrical patterns reflective of the cosmos. This alignment and incorporation suggest that the ancient Egyptians had a profound understanding of the Earth's size and shape, and its place in the solar system. Moving to Stonehenge in England, this prehistoric monument is another exemplar of ancient cosmic alignment. The arrangement of its massive stones aligns perfectly with the solstices, indicating a deep knowledge of the solar cycle. These alignments might have been used for ceremonial purposes, agricultural planning, or as a way to mark the passage of time. The precision of these alignments baffles modern scientists, given the technological limitations of the era. Carlson also points to the ancient city of Teotihuacan in Mexico, where the layout of the city and its pyramids mirrors the positions of celestial bodies. The Pyramid of the Sun, Pyramid of the Moon, and the Temple of the Feathered Serpent form a complex that aligns with specific points in the sky, suggesting a sophisticated understanding of astronomy by the Teotihuacans. These alignments and architectural feats are not confined to a single region, but are a global phenomenon. From the Nazca Lines in Peru, vast geoglyphs in the desert which some theorize to be aligned with constellations, to the megalithic temples of Malta, whose orientations align with astronomical events, ancient structures around the world show a pattern of cosmic integration. Carlson theorizes that this widespread phenomenon indicates a universally shared understanding of astronomy among ancient civilizations. This knowledge, he suggests, might have been used not just for practical purposes like agriculture, but also for deeper spiritual or metaphysical reasons. The precise nature of these alignments and constructions implies that ancient societies had a holistic view of the Earth and the cosmos, seeing themselves as an integral part of a larger cosmic order. In the intriguing exploration of Randall Carlson's sacred number theory, we find a compelling intersection between ancient mythologies and geological evidence, particularly concerning the narrative of a great flood. This segment delves into how Carlson connects the dots between geological data and the flood myths prevalent in various cultures, suggesting a catastrophic event in Earth's history that left an indelible mark on human consciousness. Across numerous civilizations, from the Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh to the biblical story of Noah's Ark, there are strikingly similar tales of a massive flood that wiped out most of humanity. Carlson investigates these myths not as mere allegorical tales, but as potential historical records of actual events. He points to geological evidence of significant climatic shifts and catastrophic flooding at the end of the last ice age, around 11,600 years ago. This period, known scientifically as the Younger Dryas, is characterized by sudden cooling followed by rapid warming, which could have led to massive glacial melting and rising sea levels. Supporting this theory is the discovery of large-scale geological features that are indicative of massive flooding. For instance, the scablands in the Pacific Northwest of the United States show evidence of having been carved by massive, swift flows of water far beyond what could be caused by normal riverine processes. 
These features include large channels cut into the bedrock, known as coolies and giant ripple marks, which are difficult to explain without invoking catastrophic flood events. Carlson posits that such a flood could have been triggered by a variety of factors, including comet impacts that led to rapid melting of ice caps, causing a sudden and dramatic rise in sea levels. This hypothesis is bolstered by evidence of extraterrestrial impact events, such as high concentrations of iridium and nanodiamonds found in geological layers dating to the Younger Dryas period. The implications of this theory are profound. If true, it suggests that many of the great flood myths are not mere stories, but are based on real events that had a catastrophic impact on prehistoric human civilizations. This perspective also underscores the fragility of human societies in the face of dramatic environmental changes. Moreover, Carlson's exploration highlights the interconnectedness of mythology, geology, and astronomy. By linking geological evidence with ancient narratives, he presents a compelling case for re-examining our understanding of ancient history and the forces that have shaped the development of human civilization. In the realm of ancient mysteries and cosmic connections, few thinkers are as provocative and insightful as Randall Carlson. His work bridges the gap between scientific observation and esoteric wisdom, uncovering a world where cataclysms sculpt the Earth's surface, cosmic cycles influence humanity's destiny, and ancient myths encode timeless truths. From deciphering geological evidence that points to massive past upheavals to unraveling the symbolism that connects civilizations across time and space, Carlson's theories invite us to view our world and its history through a profound and interconnected lens. Embark on this journey as we explore the intricate theories of cataclysms and cycles, the rock-hard evidence from geology, the predictions derived from cosmic cycles and the profound connections unearthed in ancient myths and symbolism. And Randall Carlson's work extensively delves into the concept of cataclysms and cycles, examining the history of Earth through geological evidence, ancient mythologies and astronomical data. He argues that Earth has undergone several catastrophic events, which he believes are part of larger cosmic cycles. Carlson has spent years investigating the scars left by enormous floods in the geological record. By studying the channeled scablands in the United States, he has provided evidence that colossal floods have shaped the landscape, supporting the idea that sudden cataclysmic events have played a crucial role in Earth's history. This contradicts the traditional slow and gradual geological models. One of the key components of Carlson's theories revolves around the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. This theory posits that a large comet or meteorite impact occurred around 12,800 years ago, triggering massive floods, fires, and a sudden cooling of the climate known as the Younger Dryas period. Carlson argues that this event wiped out megafauna and disrupted human civilizations. Carlson also explores ancient myths and legends that describe world-destroying floods, fires, and other catastrophes. He believes that these myths may be rooted in real events and that they preserve the memory of cataclysms that our ancestors witnessed. He connects these ancient stories with geological evidence to form a cohesive narrative. Beyond isolated events, Carlson emphasizes the idea of cosmic cycles governing these cataclysms. He suggests that Earth's position in the galaxy, combined with predictable celestial mechanics, leads to periods of increased comet activity. These cycles could then lead to recurring periods of catastrophic change on Earth. Carlson pays particular attention to the precession of the equinoxes, a 2,600-year cycle affecting Earth's orientation. He connects this astronomical phenomenon to ancient knowledge, arguing that many ancient cultures were aware of these cycles and incorporated them into their mythologies and architectures. The notion of cataclysms and cycles has profound implications for our understanding of history and our place in the universe. Carlson warns that if these cycles are real, we may be due for another cataclysmic event. As with many of Carlson's ideas, his theories about cataclysms and cycles have sparked debate and controversy. Critics argue that some of his interpretations of geological evidence are speculative, and his reliance on ancient myths as historical evidence is contentious. Nevertheless, his ideas have gained a significant following, and have contributed to a broader conversation about Earth's history and the nature of human civilization. Randall Carlson's theories often hinge on interpreting geological evidence in a way that supports the idea of cataclysms and cyclical events. 
His approach to geology integrates various scientific disciplines, including geomorphology, sedimentology, and hydrology. To present a comprehensive picture of Earth's turbulent past, a major focus of Carlson's geological investigations is the channeled scablands in the northwestern United States. These unique landscapes are marked by deep channels, coulees, and vast gravel bars, which Carlson argues are the remnants of colossal floods. He connects this with the Missoula floods, a series of catastrophic events that occurred at the end of the last ice age, caused by the repeated rupturing of an ice dam holding back glacial Lake Missoula. By closely examining the erosion patterns, sedimentary deposits, and geological formations in the channeled scablands, Carlson illustrates how water can exert immense force over a short period, reshaping landscapes in dramatic ways. He emphasizes that traditional geological models, which often prioritize slow, gradual processes, may overlook the impact of sudden cataclysmic events. Carlson also explores evidence of cosmic impacts in the geological record, he points to specific impact craters, shocked minerals and microscopic diamonds known as nanodiamonds that suggest the Earth has been struck by comets or meteorites in the past. These impacts could have triggered massive tsunamis, wildfires and climate shifts, leaving indelible marks on the planet's surface. The study of glacial geology also plays a central role in Carlson's work. He analyzes the movements and melting patterns of glaciers especially during the transitions between ice ages, to understand how these vast ice sheets have influenced sea levels, weather patterns, and ecological systems. His research helps to shed light on how glacial dynamics interact with other geological processes to create complex patterns of change. In his quest to uncover the history of ancient civilizations, Carlson delves into underwater archaeology, exploring submerged structures that may provide clues to past cataclysms, he points to sunken cities, harbors, and temples as evidence that significant changes in sea levels and tectonic activity have shaped human history. What sets Carlson's approach apart is his ability to integrate geology with other scientific and cultural domains. He combines geological evidence with astronomical data, mythological narratives, and ancient architectural alignments to present a holistic view of Earth's history. This interdisciplinary approach allows him to draw connections between seemingly disparate phenomena enriching our understanding of the planet's complex dynamics. Randall Carlson's research is not confined to the Earth alone. He extends his inquiry into the cosmos, exploring how astronomical cycles might influence geological phenomena and human history. The idea of cosmic cycles involves the recurrent patterns in the alignment of celestial bodies, solar activity, galactic interactions and more. Carlson contends that understanding these cycles can unveil significant insights into both our past and our future. One of the fundamental cosmic cycles Carlson studies is the precession of the equinoxes, a slow wobble in Earth's rotation that causes the positions of the equinoxes to shift over time. This 25,200-year cycle has been observed and documented by various ancient cultures and plays a central role in Carlson's interpretations of ancient myths, sacred geometry, and archaeological alignments. Carlson also explores solar cycles, specifically the sun's magnetic activity, which follows an approximately 11-year cycle. He links these cycles to changes in Earth's climate, arguing that fluctuations in solar radiation can cause significant variations in temperature, weather patterns, and atmospheric conditions. He illustrates how solar cycles might have contributed to historical climate events such as the Little Ice Age. On a grander scale, Carlson delves into the movements and alignments of the Milky Way galaxy, connecting them to potential cosmic collisions with comets and meteoroids. He examines evidence of past impacts and considers how these catastrophic events could coincide with mass extinctions, climatic shifts, and the rise and fall of civilizations. The concept of catastrophism underlies much of Carlson's thinking about cosmic cycles. He asserts that sudden dramatic changes in the cosmic environment can trigger equally sudden and dramatic changes on Earth. He aligns geological evidence of floods, fires and glaciation with astronomical data to present a picture of Earth's history punctuated by intense and transformational events. Beyond analyzing past events, Carlson's study of cosmic cycles has predictive potential. By understanding the patterns and periodicities of astronomical phenomena, he argues that we might foresee future cataclysms and prepare for them accordingly. 
This predictive aspect adds a practical dimension to his work, highlighting the importance of cosmic awareness in contemporary society. Finally, Carlson's approach to cosmic cycles is deeply interwoven with his explorations of mythology, ancient wisdom and sacred geometry. He sees cosmic patterns reflected in ancient texts, architectural alignments and cultural practices, suggesting a profound connection between human civilization and the cosmos. This synthesis of astronomy with human culture enriches his theories, offering a holistic view of humanity's place within the cosmic order. For Carlson, myths are more than mere fables. They are allegorical records that encapsulate profound wisdom and knowledge about Earth's history. He deciphers myths from various cultures, such as the biblical flood story, Plato's account of Atlantis, and Native American legends, arguing that they may describe actual geological events like floods, meteor impacts, and cataclysms. Carlson explores how ancient myths often contain references to cosmic phenomena, such as the movements of stars, planets, and constellations. He studies myths from Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, India, and the Americas, revealing a profound connection between earthly events and celestial bodies. This cosmic symbolism, he argues, suggests a sophisticated astronomical understanding possessed by ancient cultures. Along with cosmic symbolism, Carlson investigates the recurring patterns and geometric shapes found in ancient art, architecture, and symbols. He interprets these patterns as expressions of sacred geometry, a universal language that reflects the fundamental structures of reality. Examples include the Flower of Life, the Sri Yantra, and the Pyramid Shape, which he sees as representations of cosmic order and spiritual truths. By examining myths across various cultures, Carlson also discovers remarkable similarities and shared themes. Whether it's the serpent symbolism in Mayan legends, the Norse world tree, or the Egyptian concept of Ma'at, he finds recurring motifs that suggest a common understanding or perhaps a shared cultural heritage. This cross-cultural connection supports his theory that myths contain universal knowledge, transcending geographic and temporal boundaries. Carlson's exploration of myths is integrally connected to his research on cataclysms and cosmic cycles. He sees in the myths evidence of past catastrophic events, such as floods, volcanic eruptions, and meteor impacts. He also links mythological accounts to specific cosmic alignments, viewing them as historical records of astronomical phenomena and their effects on Earth. Randall Carlson's research transcends traditional boundaries, weaving together geology, astronomy, mythology, and sacred geometry into a tapestry that resonates with both the rational mind and the intuitive soul. Through the exploration of cataclysms that have shaped our planet, the geological footprints that bear witness to them, the cosmic patterns that influence life's ebb and flow, and the mythological narratives that have echoed through the ages, Carlson invites us to awaken to a deeper understanding of our world and ourselves. His work challenges not only our perception of history, but also our role within the cosmos. In the intricate dance of earth and sky, science and myth, Carlson offers a vision that unites, enlightens and inspires, beckoning us to tread a path of discovery that honors the wisdom of the ancients and kindles the flame of curiosity within. Did you know that beneath the swirling waters of the Mediterranean lies a city that was once the grandest port of the ancient world, its splendor now hidden beneath the waves? Today, we're diving deep into the mysterious and captivating world of Thonis Heracleion, Egypt's sunken city. Through its rise and fall, from being an emblem of prosperity to a submerged testament of time, Thonis Heracleion whispers tales that challenge our understanding of history, culture, and human achievement. So let's embark on this journey where we'll not only unmask the past, but also explore how the future of archaeological exploration is set to unfold. Today we're diving deep into the story of Thonis Heracleion, a city that once stood proud but now resides beneath the waves. But what if I told you that this submerged city was once one of the grandest in the world? Yes, let's rewind back a few millennia to the days when Thonis Heracleion was at its peak. In the time of its glory, around the 8th to the 2nd century BCE, Thonis Heracleion wasn't just a city. It was one of Egypt's most important commercial hubs and port of entry for trade with the Mediterranean. This wasn't just a backwater outpost, it was a bustling, vibrant city filled with grand temples, trading posts and residential areas. Picture this, giant statues of pharaohs and gods adorning the public spaces, stately stone steles inscribed with royal decrees, 
vessels filled with goods from Greece and beyond arriving at the city's harbor. Priests performing religious rituals at grand temples like the one dedicated to the god Amun Gereb, the supreme god of the Egyptians at the time. In many ways, Thonis Heraklion was a microcosm of the ancient world's interconnectivity. The city's strategic position near the mouth of the Nile made it a key trading hub between the Mediterranean and the Nile Delta. This wasn't just a place where goods were exchanged, it was a place where cultures, ideas and traditions intermingled. But it wasn't just about trade. Thonis Heraklion also had a spiritual significance. According to Herodotus, the city was where the hero Heracles first set foot on Egypt, and where Helen of Troy and her lover Paris sought refuge. This added a layer of myth and legend to the city's bustling trade and vibrant life. And while this paints a vivid picture of a thriving city, all this grandeur, all these tales and legends, all these monuments to human achievement would eventually sink beneath the waves. But what happened? Why did such a vital city disappear from history only to be discovered underwater centuries later? But how does a city go from being one of the most influential in the ancient world to resting beneath the sea? Well, as they say, nothing lasts forever. When Thonis Heracleion fell, it was quite literally, but why? What caused this great city to disappear into the depths of the Mediterranean? The answer, as is often the case, lies in a combination of natural and human-induced factors. Researchers believe that the city's downfall was mainly due to geological and climatic changes. Thonis Heracleion was built on the Nile Delta's unstable sediments, which are vulnerable to liquefaction. This process turns seemingly solid ground into a flowing liquid state, a bit like quicksand. Now imagine large buildings, statues and a growing population pressing down on this land. Meanwhile, the sea level was rising, not rapidly but consistently year after year. The combined weight and geological instability were ticking time bombs. Now, add to this some catastrophic natural events. It's believed that a series of earth tremors and tsunamis hit the region around the time of Thonis Heracleion's decline. Gradually, over decades or perhaps a few short centuries, the city began sinking into the sea, buildings collapsed, streets flooded, and, bit by bit, Thonis Heracleion was claimed by the Mediterranean. But here's the twist, while the city was slowly sinking, people didn't just abandon it. The inhabitants tried to adapt, to build over the sinking ruins to keep their city alive. But ultimately, nature had the final say. By the end of the 2nd century BCE, most of Thonis Heracleion had sunk beneath the sea. Alexandria, another city founded by Alexander the Great, took over as Egypt's premier port, and Thonis Heracleion gradually faded from collective memory. It wasn't until the beginning of the 21st century that the submerged city was rediscovered and brought back into the limelight, a tale we will explore in our next segment. It's easy to forget, but our past is always beneath our feet and sometimes beneath the waves. The city of Thonis Heracleion disappeared from our collective memory until the turn of the 21st century, when our narrative takes an exciting turn. We transition from history to a more modern tale of adventure and rediscovery, similar to an Indiana Jones movie but underwater. Enter French underwater archaeologist Frank Gaudio. In 2000, Godio, supported by his team from the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology, embarked on an expedition to unravel a mystery that had remained unsolved for centuries. Armed with ancient texts and cutting-edge technology, Godio searched the seabed of Abukir Bay off the coast of Egypt. What he discovered was beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Over the course of many years, his team methodically uncovered the remnants of Thonis Heracleion. Giant statues, gold coins, staley inscribed with ancient Greek and Egyptian scripts, pottery, jewelry and even shipwrecks emerged from the silt-covered seabed. But perhaps the most significant find was a huge stone slab known as the Decree of Sais, which helped to confirm beyond doubt that this was indeed the lost city of Thonis Heracleion. But imagine the difficulty of this task. Imagine being an archaeologist, but your worksite is under several meters of water, and your historical treasures are buried under centuries of silt and sediment. It's a painstaking process, moving centimeter by centimeter. Careful not to destroy the fragile relics of the past. Every object brought to the surface was meticulously documented and conserved. 
Many of these artifacts are now exhibited in museums around the world, providing us with a tangible connection to this lost city and its intriguing past. It's incredible to think that a city once so vibrant and influential could be forgotten, only to be rediscovered millennia later. Now let's venture a little deeper into the world of underwater archaeology, which plays a crucial role in unlocking the mysteries of submerged cities like Thonis Heracleion. This is no easy task, mind you. In fact, the challenges of underwater archaeology are as deep and complex as the oceans themselves. Firstly, we have the obstacle of depth. The deeper an archaeological site, the greater the pressure, the colder the temperature, and the darker it gets. These harsh conditions limit the amount of time divers can spend underwater and impair their ability to see and move, thus complicating excavation efforts. Then, there's the issue of sediment. Over centuries, sunken cities become buried under layers of sand and silt, obscuring them from view. Unlike digging on land, removing sediment underwater creates clouds of debris that reduce visibility and can potentially damage delicate artifacts. Furthermore, marine archaeology demands a comprehensive and interdisciplinary approach, combining the principles of archaeology, oceanography, marine biology, and engineering, among others. Excavation techniques must also be adapted to handle artifacts that have been immersed in water for centuries, as these objects can be extremely fragile and can disintegrate if not handled with extreme care. Equipment and technology pose another challenge. Underwater archaeology relies heavily on advanced tools such as remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, sonar mapping systems and specialized diving equipment. But these technologies are expensive and require specialized training to operate. Lastly, we can't ignore the conservation challenge. Once artifacts are brought to the surface, they must undergo extensive and often costly conservation work to prevent them from degrading in the air. This involves removing salts and other corrosive agents, carefully drying the artifacts and preserving them for further study and display. But why do we go to such lengths? Because every challenge overcome, every artifact unearthed is another piece in the jigsaw puzzle of our past. And as we've seen with the discovery and ongoing exploration of Thonis Heracleion, the results can be astonishing, opening up new windows into ancient civilizations and their untold stories. In the end, despite all the hardships and complexities, the quest to unravel the mysteries hidden beneath the waves continues. Because just as Michelangelo once said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free, underwater archaeologists see the whispers of history in the deep blue and dive until they set them free. As we delve into the future of Thonis Heracleion, we find ourselves face to face with a combination of excitement, anticipation and concern. Yes, the journey of discovery isn't over yet. In fact, one might say it has just begun. The current body of knowledge we have about Thonis Heracleion is like a puzzle with many missing pieces. Each dive, each excavation, promises the potential discovery of new artifacts that could help us form a more complete picture of this ancient city. However, the future isn't just about uncovering what lies beneath. New technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, and 3D modeling can play a significant role in bringing the story of Thonis Heracleion to a broader audience. Imagine strapping on a virtual reality headset and walking through the ancient streets of Thonis Heracleion, seeing the buildings, the artifacts and the people as they were thousands of years ago. Isn't that mind-boggling? Yet, while we dream of digital recreations and archaeological revelations, there is an urgent concern that looms large, the threat of climate change. Rising sea levels, warming oceans, and extreme weather events pose serious risks to underwater archaeological sites. These impacts can accelerate the degradation of artifacts and structures, and even make some sites inaccessible for study. This urgency further underlines the need for continued exploration and preservation efforts. There's an ongoing debate about whether we should leave artifacts in situ, preserving them underwater, or bring them to the surface for study and conservation. As technology advances, we might be able to do both, explore and conserve the site underwater while also digitally documenting and replicating the finds for study and display. And there you have it. From the glories of its heyday to the mysteries shrouding its decline, the story of Thonis Heracleion is indeed a fascinating saga. Its rediscovery not only gives us a glimpse into an era long gone, but also presents us with opportunities to revolutionize how we perceive and preserve our past. As we look towards the future, 
it's clear that the tale of Thonis Heracleon is far from over. With advancing technology and undying human curiosity, we stand at the brink of even more groundbreaking discoveries. So, as we bid adieu to the sunken city of Thonis Heracleon for now, remember, when you look at the vast and timeless desert of Egypt, the word Kemet might not immediately come to mind. Yet this term, which means black land in the ancient Egyptian language, was once used to describe this area, highlighting the fertile soil along the banks of the Nile River, the lifeblood of the civilization we know today as ancient Egypt. But, were the Kemites merely skilled farmers and pyramid builders, or was there more to them? Could there possibly be connections to other worldly beings? The term Kemites stems from Kemet, which translates to the black land in the ancient Egyptian language. This phrase illustrates the contrast between the fertile black soil of the Nile River's banks and the harsh surrounding desert, often referred to as Deshret or the Red Land. However, the term Kemet signifies far more than a geographical landscape. It represented a civilization that was one of the most enduring and influential in human history. The people of Kemet, the Kemetes, constructed a culture that has contributed a great deal to the world in various fields such as architecture, mathematics, science, and art. The Kemites were builders of an incredible magnitude. They are known for the creation of the pyramids, grand burial structures for their pharaohs, and the Sphinx, one of the most iconic monuments worldwide. The sheer precision and scale of these constructions are an enduring testament to their engineering prowess and architectural ingenuity. They were also highly sophisticated in their administrative systems, maintaining detailed records of their pharaohs, political affairs and religious rituals. These have been crucial in enabling us to piece together the history and societal structure of Kemet. The religion of the Kemites was intricately woven into every aspect of their daily life. They had a polytheistic belief system with a pantheon of gods and goddesses, each overseeing different aspects of life and nature. These religious beliefs not only guided their moral code, but also played a significant role in their understanding of the world, life, death and the afterlife. In the realm of art, Kemets were masterful. Their sculptures, paintings and pottery were not only beautiful but also carried significant symbolic meaning. These artifacts provide a window into their values, beliefs and everyday life, contributing to our understanding of this extraordinary civilization. The association between the Kemites and extraterrestrial theories mainly originates from their incredible achievements in construction, astronomy and science that appear to far surpass what would have been achievable with the technology thought to be available to them. This includes, most notably, the construction of the Pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx, which showcase an astounding level of precision and understanding of complex mathematics and engineering. One element of this theory focuses on the construction of the pyramids, specifically the Great Pyramid of Giza. The pyramid's alignment with the magnetic North Pole, the precise dimensions and ratios correlating with complex mathematics and astronomical phenomena, and the extraordinary undertaking of constructing such a monument with huge stones, all have led some to question whether the Kemites had help from technologically advanced extraterrestrial beings. Moreover, the precise alignment of the pyramids of Giza with the stars in the belt of Orion has also been used as evidence for this theory. This alignment, along with various other astronomical alignments found in their architecture and art, suggests a deep understanding of the cosmos that seems uncannily advanced for the time. Another aspect of Kemet's civilization that feeds into this theory is their mythology and religious beliefs. Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and artwork are full of references to sky gods, powerful beings who descended from the stars and strange objects seen in the sky. Proponents of the ancient astronaut theory suggest that these are not myths or symbols, but literal depictions of extraterrestrial visitors. It's worth noting, however, that these theories often come under scrutiny. Many scholars argue that these theories underestimate the ingenuity, intelligence and skills of ancient human civilizations. They point out that with an understanding of simple machines, human labor and time, the Kemites could have achieved these remarkable constructions on their own. Whether or not the Kemites had extraterrestrial help is a matter of personal belief. What is undeniable is the awe-inspiring and influential legacy that Kemet civilization has left behind. Now, 
diving into the advanced knowledge of the Kemites. Now, this is where things get really interesting. The civilization of Kemet was notably advanced for its time, with numerous achievements in various fields such as astronomy, mathematics, architecture and medicine. Firstly, the Kemites were skilled astronomers. Their understanding of celestial bodies was so profound that they were able to develop a calendar that is almost as accurate as the one we use today. Based on the movements of the sun, moon and stars, they formulated a 365-day calendar divided into 12 months. This marked a significant leap in the understanding of timekeeping. Moreover, they developed complex mathematical concepts including fractions and geometric principles, which allowed them to create stunning architectural masterpieces such as the pyramids. They understood principles of engineering, physics and geometry that wouldn't be rediscovered until thousands of years later. In the field of medicine, Kemites demonstrated advanced knowledge too. Papyrus scripts reveal they had knowledge of human anatomy, surgical procedures and even remedies for various ailments. The medical practices were so developed that some even argue they carried out complex procedures like brain surgery. The complexity of these achievements has led some to speculate about a possible extraterrestrial influence. Could such a civilization have gained such advanced knowledge on their own? Or was there external help involved? Theories propose that the Kemites could have had contact with an alien civilization that shared their knowledge with them, sparking the rapid development of their society. But of course, this is all conjecture and the debate continues. Now let's plunge headfirst into one of the most enduring mysteries of the Kemites, the pyramids. The pyramids of Egypt, built by the Kemites, are one of the most recognizable and enigmatic structures of the ancient world. The most famous of them, the Great Pyramid of Giza, is a marvel of engineering and precision that even modern technology struggles to replicate. This Great Pyramid is estimated to consist of over 2.3 million blocks of stone, each weighing an average of 2.5 tons and some even up to 15 tons. The precision of its construction is staggering. Its base is level to within just 2.1 centimeters and the sides are oriented to the cardinal directions within three arc minutes. The construction methodology behind such a mammoth task is an enduring mystery. Several theories have been proposed about how these structures were built, from simple manual labor to complex machines and even supernatural or alien assistance. One of the most prevalent theories is that the Kemites constructed a spiraling ramp to haul the massive stones to the required heights. However, the sheer logistics of such a venture in terms of workforce, resources and time make this theory a subject of debate. More fringe theories have posited that the Kemites had access to advanced technology, perhaps even extraterrestrial. These theories often point to the precision and alignment of the pyramids with celestial bodies, a task that would seemingly require a more advanced understanding of mathematics and astronomy than was available at the time. One of the most fascinating elements of Kemet's rich culture is its art. This isn't simply due to its aesthetic appeal, but more intriguingly, the narratives and depictions that the art encompasses. The Kemetic art includes a wide range of expressive forms, from sculpture and architecture to relief and pottery, and of course, the remarkable hieroglyphic writing system. Looking closer at the artwork, some researchers and theorists have pointed out representations that could potentially denote alien encounters. This is a contentious interpretation and is not universally accepted by historians or Egyptologists, but it certainly makes for a compelling discussion. Among the most cited pieces are the relief depictions found in the Temple of Siti, once in Abydos. This particular relief has stirred controversy as it seems to show objects resembling modern-day helicopters, submarines and even spaceships. How could this be? given that these technologies wouldn't exist for thousands of years after the relief was created. Then there are the depictions of the gods themselves. Many of them, like the sky god Horus, who is represented as a man with the head of a falcon, and the god Ra, who is frequently portrayed traveling through the sky in a sunboat, are theorized by some to symbolize extraterrestrial beings. Critics argue these interpretations are merely a result of pareidolia, the human tendency to perceive meaningful patterns where none actually exist. However, 
proponents of the alien theory believe that these peculiarities are too significant to dismiss as coincidence. What's clear is that comatic art laden with its mystical symbols and cryptic depictions is still a fertile ground for exploration and interpretation. While the comatic civilization's feats of engineering, medicine and astronomy were truly remarkable, some believe the alien connection theories are a step too far, an overly speculative leap that discounts the achievements of the ancient Kimites themselves. In this segment, we delve into the skepticism and the rational view of these theories. Firstly, it's important to acknowledge that correlation does not imply causation. Yes, there are intriguing overlaps between some ancient Egyptian depictions and what we might interpret as UFOs or alien figures today. But this doesn't necessarily mean that aliens were involved. After all, to the untrained eye, a cloud can resemble a dragon or a castle. But this doesn't make it so. Many experts and historians argue that interpreting the gods and hieroglyphs as aliens or UFOs is a form of cultural reductionism, simplifying complex, symbolic artwork into an anachronistic, literal interpretation. Egyptologists point out that hieroglyphs were highly stylized, symbolic and sacred, often representing ideas or concepts rather than physical entities. The advanced knowledge demonstrated by the Kemites, while certainly impressive, may be more a testament to their sophisticated understanding of mathematics, astronomy and engineering, rather than alien intervention. Remember, the Kemites were one of the longest-lasting civilizations in human history, giving them ample time to develop and refine their knowledge. Finally, there's the issue of Occam's razor, the principle that the simplest explanation is usually the best one. In this case, the simpler explanation is that the Kemites, through hundreds of years of intellectual pursuit, achieved their advancements on their own. While the idea of ancient alien visitations is an exciting theory, it adds a layer of complexity and speculation that isn't necessarily supported by hard evidence. So were the Kemites, the people of the Black Land, the benefactors of alien knowledge? Or were they simply skilled artisans, scientists and builders who utilized their understanding of the world around them to create one of the most enduring and fascinating civilizations in human history? Like the Sphinx, the answer remains enigmatic, silently gazing out into the sands of time. But one thing's for sure, the legacy of the Kamites, whether divinely, extraterrestrially or humanly inspired, continues to captivate us and will likely do so for many millennia to come. Picture the grandeur of ancient Egypt, mighty pharaohs, the majestic sphinx and of course the awe-inspiring pyramids. Now take a leap through time to the Roman Empire, famous for its innovative engineering and renowned military conquests. But what if I told you that these two mighty civilizations are more intertwined than you'd ever imagined? What if the pyramids, one of the ancient world's greatest wonders, held a fascinating chapter in the narrative of Roman expansion? Yes, that's right. Today, we'll dive into the dramatic shift from the Pharaonic era of Egypt to its time under Roman rule and unravel the influence of the Romans on Egypt's most iconic structures. To appreciate the magnitude of change that the end of the Pharaoh's era marked, we must first understand the incredible influence and grandeur of the ancient Egyptian civilization. Spanning over 3,000 years, the era of the pharaohs was marked by a series of ruling dynasties, each leaving its mark on the land of the Nile. From the Old Kingdom era, when the pyramids were constructed, to the Middle and New Kingdoms, when Egypt expanded its influence through military campaigns and trade, the civilization thrived, prospered and demonstrated its resilience in the face of historical turmoil. And at the heart of it all were the pharaohs, the god kings of Egypt, the intermediaries between the gods and the people. Through an intricate, deeply spiritual system of governance, these rulers commanded the respect and devotion of their subjects, ensuring the continuity of their civilization. However, the arrival of Alexander the Great in 332 BC marked a significant turning point. The Ptolemaic dynasty that he established was Hellenistic in nature, marking the beginning of the end of pharaonic rule. Cleopatra VII, the last pharaoh, was a symbol of this fusion of Greek and Egyptian cultures. Her intelligence, charisma and strategic alliances with Roman leaders Julius Caesar and Mark Antony made her a significant historical figure. Yet her reign was fraught with political challenges and personal tragedies. When she famously took her life in 30 BC, the age of the pharaohs effectively ended. 
The Egypt that Cleopatra left behind was an empire on the precipice of profound change. This period marked the end of Egypt's independence and the beginning of a new era under the control of a burgeoning empire. Rome. Now, as we move into the Roman conquest of Egypt, we find ourselves navigating a series of strategic moves and political intrigues. With the death of Cleopatra, the land of the Nile was effectively annexed by Rome and turned into a province under the control of Octavian, who would later be known as Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. But why was Egypt so attractive to the Romans? The reasons were primarily economic and strategic. Egypt was the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. Its fertile lands, nourished by the annual flooding of the Nile, yielded crops that fed the Roman populace and fueled its armies. Plus, it was a gateway to the riches of Africa and the Near East. Roman control of Egypt marked a significant shift in power dynamics, as it was the first time Egypt had been ruled by a foreign power. Yet even as the Romans wielded their influence, they couldn't ignore the deep cultural and religious roots of the Egyptians. They adopted some of the local gods, including Isis and even the tradition of pharaohs to an extent. The Roman emperors, like the pharaohs before them, projected themselves as godlike figures, often adorning themselves in traditional Egyptian garb in statues and reliefs. Still, as they maintained this facade of cultural integration, the Romans also pursued their own interests. One such interest, intriguingly, might have been the mysterious and awe-inspiring structures dotting the Egyptian landscape, the pyramids. So what did it really mean to be Egypt under Roman rule? And while there was certainly cultural assimilation as Romans adopted Egyptian gods and traditions, Egypt also became a Roman province. This meant taxation and Egypt was heavily taxed. The fertile Nile Delta was a treasure trove producing grain, papyrus and precious gems, all of which found their way into Roman coffers. Yet even as the riches of Egypt fueled the Roman Empire, there were also periods of unrest. The Egyptian populace, after centuries of being ruled by god kings, now found themselves subjects of a distant emperor and Roman bureaucrats who were more interested in wealth extraction than in the preservation of the ancient Egyptian culture. The impact of the Roman rule on the Egyptian landscape was also significant. Roman architecture began to sprout across Egypt, from the coastal city of Alexandria to the southern city of Aswan. Temples to Roman gods were constructed alongside ancient Egyptian temples, and Roman-styled villas were built alongside traditional Egyptian homes. The juxtaposition of these two distinct architectural styles showcases the collision of two powerful civilizations. In the midst of this cultural and architectural synthesis, the pyramids stood timeless. What the Romans thought of these ancient structures and how they interacted with them is a question that delves deep into the realm of speculation. A curiosity that tickles our imagination, the pyramids, timeless behemoths of stone, their grandeur a testament to a civilization's past glory. But when the Romans first laid their eyes on them, what did they think? What did they do? We know from various accounts that the Romans, like the Greeks before them, were fascinated by the pyramids, their size, their age, their engineering. Everything about them was a wonder. Some Roman writers, such as Pliny the Elder, wrote extensively about them. Pliny, in his natural history, called them an idle and foolish exhibition of royal wealth, but his detailed descriptions betray a fascination with their complexity and longevity. But did the Romans ever venture inside? Were they, as some believe, the last people to raid the pyramids for their treasure? Archaeological evidence suggests that by the time the Romans arrived in Egypt, the pyramids had been standing for over 2,000 years. Many of them were already heavily looted, and most of the treasure was long gone. The Great Pyramid itself was sealed, and it is highly unlikely the Romans had the technology to break in without leaving evidence of their intrusion. Yet stories of Roman treasure hunters guided by ancient maps and legends seeking the secrets of the pyramids persist. Could there have been rogue Roman officials or adventurous explorers who attempted to find hidden chambers and undiscovered loot? The notion is romantic, albeit historically tenuous. In truth, the Romans probably treated the pyramids with the same curiosity and awe as we do. They were relics of a bygone era timeless monuments that represented a civilization that was ancient even in their time. Rather than the ransacking conquerors some may envision, the Romans may have been the first tourists gazing upon the wonders of a fallen empire. The line between treasure hunter and archaeologist can be a blurry one. 
Did Romans ransack the pyramids in search of hidden wealth, or were they preservationists attempting to safeguard and understand these impressive structures? Let's dive deeper. We have records of Roman emperors such as Augustus and Hadrian visiting Egypt and expressing a great interest in its antiquities. In fact, many Roman leaders funded expeditions to explore and document Egypt's monuments. They brought back a wealth of knowledge about Egyptian culture, language and history. So it's clear the Romans held a fascination for Egypt's past, but did this translate into a respect for its physical artifacts? Unfortunately, the answer is not straightforward. While some Roman officials genuinely sought to understand and preserve Egypt's heritage, others saw the ancient monuments as resources to be exploited. For example, there's evidence of stone from the pyramids being quarried for other building projects. The situation gets even murkier when we consider the concept of treasure hunting. The phrase conjures images of rogue explorers plundering tombs and temples for gold and jewels. But in the context of the Roman period, treasure could also refer to knowledge, historical artifacts or even mystical power. Pyramids with their ancient hidden chambers could hold untold secrets in the Roman imagination. In a strange twist of fate, the Roman obsession with Egypt might have inadvertently led to some preservation. Many Egyptian artifacts found their way to Rome, effectively being saved from the ravages of time and later more destructive conquerors. So the Romans' relationship with the pyramids and Egypt's treasures was complicated, to say the least. A mix of reverence, curiosity, greed and pragmatism that has left us with a wealth of questions and a rich, albeit confounding, historical legacy. The Roman period was a pivotal chapter in the long, complex story of Egypt. How the Romans interacted with the pyramids, the Sphinx and other Egyptian antiquities has significantly shaped our understanding of these iconic structures. For one thing, Romans played a key role in the spread of Egyptomania, the fascination with all things Egyptian. This phenomenon was popular in Rome even before Egypt was annexed as a province. Statues, obelisks and other Egyptian antiquities were transported to Rome to decorate public buildings and private villas, and the Roman aristocracy even had a fad for Egyptian-style garden ornaments. But Rome's influence went beyond simply popularizing Egyptian style. Roman engineers, architects and scholars also studied and documented Egyptian monuments in great detail. The records they left behind have been invaluable for modern Egyptologists, providing insight into the state of these structures in antiquity. Another Roman contribution was the preservation of Egypt's built heritage, albeit indirectly. By incorporating Egypt into their empire, the Romans brought relative stability and prosperity to the region, allowing for the maintenance and repair of ancient monuments. While there were cases of Romans quarrying stone from the pyramids for their own construction projects on the whole, these monuments were largely respected and preserved during the Roman period. However, the Romans also unwittingly contributed to some destruction. The trade in Egyptian antiquities, coupled with the frequent treasure hunts, led to the loss and damage of many artifacts and structures. Overall, the Romans left an indelible mark on Egypt and its ancient heritage. Their influence is evident in everything from the physical state of the pyramids to our contemporary fascination with this civilization. The story of the Romans and the pyramids is a complex tapestry, woven from threads of curiosity, respect, exploitation and ultimately preservation. It's a testament to the enduring allure of Egypt's past and a reminder of how our understanding of history is shaped not only by the events of antiquity, but by those who have studied it in the centuries since. And as always, thanks for watching.